Welcome everyone. My name is Tron Noriega and I'm the director of the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center. We are here on campus outside the beautiful Haynes Hall where the center and its library are located. I want to welcome you to this very special event today recognizing the contributions of the Honorable Esteban Edward Torres. Typically, the awarding of the UCLA Medal is done in person and on campus. But we all know these are difficult and uncertain times. So today we are coming to you online. But in all other ways, we are gathered here with you as a national community to honor a man whose life exemplifies the values and standards shared by you and by UCLA. Esteban has been an important influence in my own life and work, and I know that many of you can share similar stories. I want to thank Esteban and the Torres family for allowing us to recognize him in this way. Thank you. Shortly, you'll hear from UCLA Chancellor Jean Block, who will present the UCLA Medal, as well as from Esteban himself. The presentation of the award will be followed by a tribute video. Then, I'll be back again to offer some closing words and special thanks to those who have made this event possible. But first, it is my pleasure to introduce Vice Provost David Yu, who oversees the Institute of American Cultures that houses the Ethnic Studies Research Centers at UCLA. So let's go inside. My name is David Yu, and I serve as the Vice Provost for the UCLA Institute of American Cultures, the administrative hub of our Ethnic Studies Research Centers the American Indian Studies Center, the Asian American Studies Center, the Ralph J. Bunt Center for African American Studies, and the Chicano Studies Research Center. In 2019, as UCLA marked its centennial year, our institute and centers celebrated 50 years of advancing research for social justice. Today, we are really glad to be able to join the Office of the Chancellor and the Chicano Studies Research Center in this UCLA medal event. It is now my pleasure to introduce the UCLA Chancellor, Jean Block. Greetings. I'm glad you're joining us to honor a local hero and award the UCLA Medal to Congressman Esteban Torres. Esteban Edward Torres was born in Arizona on January 27, 1930. His early years were spent living in a miner's camp of tent dwellings in Miami, Arizona. Depression-era America was unkind to many immigrants and Mexican and Mexican-Americans endured waves of deportations. Sadly, the Torres family suffered these injustices when Torres was only a small boy and his father was deported in retaliation for his labor organizing. Torres never saw his father again. Growing up during the Depression without a father to help guide him, facing widespread discrimination against Latinos, was a heavy burden. But that burden did not break Torres. Instead, it helped inspire an ethic that guided his career. Organize, organize, organize. Speak up. Never, never give up. Torres lived that ethic and heeded the call to service. He heeded that call serving in the U.S. Army during the Korean War and earning the rank of Sergeant First Class. After the war, he again heeded the call to service, when while working as a welder in the auto industry, his fellow members in the United Auto Workers Union elected him chief steward of the local 230. He did the call to service when he was later appointed the UAW organizer for the Western region of the United States, then as UAW international representative in Washington, D.C., and later as a union, the union's director for Caribbean and Latin American affairs. His concern for workers' well-being drove his deepening involvement with economic justice issues, and in 1968, he heeded the call to service again by beginning the East Los Angeles Community Union, a community action organization that became one of the nation's largest anti-poverty agencies under his guidance. Torres' leadership impressed people beyond Los Angeles, of course. And in 1977, President Jimmy Carter appointed him permanent representative to the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO an ambassador-level position that he followed by serving in the White House Office of Hispanic Affairs from 1979 through 1981 under President Carter. In the early 1980s, seeing clearly that people of color and those of modest income were being cut out and left behind by supply-side economics, Torres declared, 
Our cities are really in a state of decay. Our road systems, our bridges, our waterways, our court facilities. Torres ran for Congress and was elected in 1982. He went on to win several re-election campaigns with overwhelming support. Among other duties, Torres sat on the Banking, Finance, and Urban Affairs Committee, the Small Business Committee, and the Appropriations Committee, and chaired subcommittees on consumer affairs, environment, and labor. As a laborer and union leader, Torres deeply understood that economic vulnerabilities faced by many Americans were made worse by the banking and finance industries. So he authored the Truth in Savings Act. That law required banks to disclose clear information about fees terms and conditions for savings accounts. He also helped pass legislation to improve consumers' access to their credit histories and to allow them to more easily challenge errors in their credit reports. Torres also established himself as an environmental justice advocate and helped develop the Hazardous Waste Control Act of 1983, which required landfill owners to conduct studies on the health risks their properties posed to nearby communities. While the absence of his father deeply impacted him, so did the presence of his mother and grandmother. As he explained, they were very strong women, very educated, and very proud to be Mexicans. They instilled that pride in Torres, and it helped him lead to serve the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and become an example of effective leadership at a time when few Latinos were present at the highest levels of our government. His commitment to the community was matched only by his commitment to the family he created with his wife, Arce, with whom he raised five children, Carmen, Camille, Selena, Esteban, and our very own Rena. I have no doubt that Rena's enormous contributions to UCLA have been inspired by her father's example of service. At UCLA, we teach our students to care deeply and to work hard, to seek common ground and to prize the public good, to build bridges and create pathways for those who come behind. Esteban Torres has done all that and more. It is for these reasons that I am proud to bestow upon him the UCLA Medal. Before, before we hear from Congressman Torres, I'd like to read the citation that accompanies the UCLA Medal, which says, Esteban Torres, from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to the U.S. House of Representatives, from the inner cities to the international stage, you have put service at the center of your professional life. As a legislator, labor leader, activist, and diplomat, you have demonstrated a keen understanding of the ways government policy translates into real impact on individual lives. Your legislative career has produced protections for the safety, health, and well-being of people often overlooked by the powerful and the comfortable. Your willingness to confront hard issues like poverty, environmental racism, arms control, consumer protection, domestic violence, and more demonstrates a vigorous commitment to the public good writ large. At the same time, your championing of Latino Americans has opened doors, raised consciousness, and made powerful contributions to the important cause of racial equity and inclusion. Your legacy includes the legislation you helped pass, the high school that bears your name, and the lives of those who have benefited from your care and concern. Your principled voice and inspiring example will continue to impact the people of Los Angeles, California, and the United States for generations to come. Your civic-minded commitment to the public service and justice embodies the best values of UCLA. For these reasons, we are proud to bestow upon you the UCLA Medal. Thank you, Congressman Torres. Thank you, Chancellor Block, for your kind remarks and for the reading of the citation that accompanies the UCLA Medal. You have my respect and appreciation for your outstanding leadership. You have brought this world-renowned educational institution into the future, and I am truly honored to receive this award. I want to thank Chon Noriega of the Chicano Studies Research Center and Vice Provost David Yu of UCLA's Institute of American Cultures in calling for my nomination, and I'm grateful and humbled by their gesture. I thank you for supporting them and the work of the Institute and the centers. Of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge the many people behind the scenes 
working and putting this together, this virtual event. Thank you to all. Today's current events have shown that the students that you are teaching, mentoring, and empowering with knowledge are the future leaders of our communities and of this nation. Education is key, and it is their turn to lead. And when I think back over my own 90 years, I'm humbled by the incredible experiences and opportunities that I have had during my life. When I was three years of age, my mother and my grandmother left Arizona where I was born. And we came to East Los Angeles after my father was deported. Now the government called it repatriation, but the fact is I never saw my father again. Times were tough for everyone, but especially for migrants and for Mexican Americans who were also caught in the government's repatriation efforts and objected to immigrant bashing and family separations, much like we see today. When I graduated, graduated in 1949 from Garfield High School, I enlisted in the United States Army, where I was, I was stationed for, for four years in Stuttgart, Germany during the Korean War. The Army opened up the world to me and when I returned home to East LA, the little girl I had known since we were children was now 18 years old. R.C. Sanchez and I were married, and here we are 65 years later with five children, 12 great-grandchildren, and five great-great-grandchildren. To support our growing family, I worked as a welder at the Chrysler Auto Plant in Maywood, California. Now, then I joined a union, the United Auto Workers Union, and I ran for a shop steward to advocate for my fellow assembly line workers and to address the social and economic disparities that I too had experienced in growing up. Later, the UAW appointed me as an international labor organizer, and I became their director of Hispanic affairs in our Washington, D.C. office. My mission was simple, to organize automotive industry workers in the Western Hemisphere, primarily in Argentina, Chile, Peru, and Mexico. In the 60s, there were only a handful of Mexican Americans living in Washington, D.C. But we came together with other progressives to fight for social justice, racial equality, workers' rights, and, and an end to the war that was taking the lives of too many Chicanos kids from our hometown and from across the Southwest. At the same time, 3,000 miles away in California, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta were organizing the farm workers and engaged in boycotts of lettuce and grapes and calling for fair wages and living conditions for our essential agri agricultural workers. UAW President Walter Ruther and his brother Victor, who were my mentors, were early supporters of the civil rights movement, Cesar Chavez's organizing efforts and other social initiatives that would better the lives of working people. With the Ruther support, I returned to East Los Angeles with a Ford Foundation grant and co-founded the East Los Angeles Community Union, Teleku. Teleku was, it, was, it, was known by its name, to provide economic opportunities and give political voice to our community. I was also involved in the labor organizing work of Chavez. Working with other Chicano and Chicano activists here in California and throughout the Southwest during the Chicano movement, I was elected president of the Congress of, of Mexican American Unity. University students, including your very own UCLA, were making their voices heard and bringing about important changes to the cause. In 1977, Jimmy Carter nominated me as a U.S. Rep permanent representative with ambassador rank 
to UNESCO, and we moved to Paris, France. As he was preparing for his second run in the presidency, my family and I returned to Washington, D.C., and I joined his senior staff as a special assistant for Hispanic Affairs in the White House. But then with Carter's loss, I planned to return to the UAW to continue organizing, but was called upon to run for another newly created congressional seat in my hometown of Los Angeles. I was elected in 1982 to the U.S. House of Representatives, and the next 16 years, I proudly served the 34th Congressional District, which included large portions of the San Gabriel Valley. I wasn't a young man anymore. The grueling work and constant cross-country travel were taking its toll. The political scene was becoming more and more divisive, perhaps tame in comparison to now, but it was really the beginning of where we are today. I retired in 1999 knowing that this was a time for the next generation of, of, of activists and leaders who were gaining political momentum and successes at the national, state, and local levels. They were taking up the fight for immigrant rights, racial equality, social and economic justice, and educational equality. UCLA's faculty and its world-renowned scholars, your students, and many people who call UCLA home continue this very important work. I'm honored to receive the UCLA medal, and I'm grateful to you, to my wonderful family, and everyone who has honored me today. Thank you. Thank you. I am Javier Becerra, Attorney General for the State of California. And to Esteban Torres, I want to congratulate him on once again being honored by our state, and in this case UCLA, for being such a great American and certainly a great Californian. I've known Esteban and considered him a friend for nearly 30 years. He and Arcee are, are like family to, to me and my wife. In fact, when I got elected to Congress in 1992, Esteban offered me a home in Washington, D.C. as I traveled to settle into my new job as a member of Congress. He and Arcee were not only generous, but they became the backbone of my work in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was able to learn from Esteban. I was able to understand the world of Washington through Esteban, and he and R.C. became dear, dear friends over the years. I consider Esteban Torres a mentor, a dear friend, and a great American who has contributed immensely to the improvement of the opportunity for working Americans. Uh, he is grassroots, he is salt of the earth, but he also is a fighter and a champion. And I want to thank him for all the work that he has done to elevate people who never had much opportunity to give them hope and more importantly, give their children the chance to dream. I have any number of great stories about Esteban Torres, about the decisions he made moving forward uh, when he got on to the Appropriations Committee as one of the very few Latinos in uh, the Congress of the United States to actually be there helping decide where to pull the purse strings. Uh, I remember the fights that we engaged in on behalf of the folks in California, on behalf of working people, trying to make sure that we were representing the people who work so hard but get very little attention. And I remember a particular case where still as a new member in Congress in my first term, we were running up the steps of the, uh, the east steps of the Capitol on our way to go vote before time expired. And then as we were dashing up those stairs, I, I turned to Congressman Torres and I said, Esteban, you know, sometimes I forget uh, the place we're about to step into. And right there in the middle of the steps, he stopped me, grabbed my shoulder and stopped me. And he said, turn around. And there you could see the panorama of the uh, Supreme Court, the Library of Congress, the Jefferson Building, and of course the office buildings of Congress. And in that majesty, he said to me, Javier, never forget where you're about to enter. 
because very few Americans, especially those like us, have ever had that opportunity. I never forgot. And I've always remembered that because in his very humble way, he sent a very powerful message. When you have a chance to do something like that, be a member of Congress, change the world for those who never had an opportunity, never forget. And so Esteban, to you and to Arcee, to all your family, just know I never forget how much of a friend you were, how much you always treated me like family, but how much, most importantly, you have meant to the United States of America. Thank you for all your contributions. Be well. The one and only great Esteban Torres has been an inspiration and it has been an honor to get to work with him. When we created the first school in over 80 years in East Los Angeles, the name Esteban Torres has been a symbol in so many ways of the possibilities uh, for a kid like me and for the kids in our school district. He comes from very, very uh, humble uh, beginnings in, in uh, Arizona. His father was uh, deported to Mexico when the Stemon was uh, three years old. And in spite of, in spite of all those hardships, uh, with a large family raised by his mother, Esteban was very much a self-made man who served in, in the military, got a job in the auto assembly uh, plant here locally, I believe in Southgate, became very active involved in the unions, and is also um, a very good artist and sculptor. So how do I know Esteban? Uh, well, I, I certainly knew him before I ever met him. Uh, he's a legendary figure among the generation uh, coming out of the 40s that really pushed to get political representation and to be able to serve their community uh, through local, state, and federal government. Esteban really pushed for Latino representation both in front of and behind the camera. And he did serve in the Carter administration, uh, first as the uh, ambassador to UNESCO, uh, where he was based in Paris, and uh, later as a special assistant to President Carter. Uh, directly in the White House. And of course, Esteban went on to serve, uh, I believe, until 1999 in Congress. I got to see firsthand what a statesman he was, what a diplomat he was, how well he worked with people, how he was able to look at situations and look at issues, analyze them, and uh, bring people together to, uh, to address them. He comes out of labor organizing, and I think labor organizing is a core skill that can really serve any effort aimed at social justice. He's truly a wonderful, thoughtful, and, and highly informed person about the world. When you meet with Esteban, you meet a man with tremendous integrity, a man who is deeply engaged in and committed to the world, and a man who knows exactly where he comes from and who he is and you have a wonderful dialogue with him. And at the end of that, you realize you've agreed to do something. <laughs> and that in doing that something, it will help things get better. A couple things really stood out to me that resonate with our institute and our centers. Um, the first was your art. And the second area is your commitment to social justice. Congressman Torres, congratulations. So on behalf of, of all of us at La Plaza, and we want to wish him all the best and congratulate him on this very important work. Congratulations Esteban on the, receiving the UCLA medal. Uh, it's a well-deserved recognition uh, for a life dedicated to public service. And at the same time, the UCLA is better uh, for having you on our list of UCLA medal recipients and for being the stewards of your legacy through the papers you have established here. Thank you. I will just say thank you, Congressman Torres, for leading and loving and believing in so many of us that have benefited from your life's work. Wow. Thank you, Monica, John, and David, for your tributes. And thank you, Chancellor Block, 
for giving us a very moving sense of Esteban's life and career over the last 90 years. I want to thank everyone who helped make this event possible. You'll see their names listed in the credits uh, that follow. Esteban, you have our admiration, our gratitude, and our love. I first met you in 1999 as you were retiring from the House of Representatives. And rather than rest on your laurels, you went on to chair the Latino, National Latino Media Council for 17 years. You helped establish memorandums of understanding with the major networks and studios, and to start an annual report card to hold them accountable. And by 2002, for the first time, there were three Latino-produced television series on the air. As a media scholar, I am proud to have worked with you and to have learned from you how to advance social justice through art and activism. We conclude our program here in the library of the Chicano Studies Research Center. This is where we house over 100 linear feet of archival documents that make up the Esteban Torres papers. The library has the largest archival and digital collections documenting the Chicano and Latino populations. Everyone is welcome to come see these materials. Even now, while we are closed, you have access to our online resources and can email our librarians. Esteban, your impact is found not just in the archive, but in the faculty, staff, and students who actively build upon your legacy. Behind me is an exhibition featuring portraits of artist activists by doctoral student Angelica Becerra. Esteban, you're in good company here at UCLA. Thank you. And I want to thank you all for joining us today uh, in this celebration of Esteban Torres. And I wish you all safety and health in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you.